Welcome to Chapter 2, Early Civilizations. Early mankind were hunter-gatherers. They foraged for food, eating plants that were easily accessible, hunted and fished for meat. Throughout the earliest centuries of mankind's history, they began to domesticate various food sources, uh, rice in Asia, wheat in the Mesopotamian region and Egypt, yams in the Andes in South America, and even maize in Mexico. And then realizing that they could have more food and a more stable food supply if they farmed, they began to domesticate these plants and uh, developed farming. And with farming came a surplus of food. A farmer could produce more food than his family could eat, and thus he could trade uh, that food, that surplus food, for other necessities. This was a process. This is not something that happened overnight. Uh, this was a process that took place over centuries, even uh, over a millennia. And uh, it's often referred to as the first agricultural revolution. Uh, it's a term that most historians no longer use, but uh, it's still uh, used here and there, especially in uh, popular uh, historical references. But uh, this uh, so-called agricultural revolution was the key to the development of civilizations. Uh, consequently, the earliest civilizations began to develop in the fertile river valleys uh, where crops were easily farmed uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, fertile river valleys have plenty of water supply and the soil is fertile for uh, just, just what you need for, for planting crops and, and growing them. Now there are several major river valleys that civilizations are going to begin to develop around. The first major river valley is going to be the Mesopotamian River Valley uh, associated with the Tigris and Euphrates rivers uh, that empty into the Persian Gulf. This is where we know as the, the Middle East. So that's uh, one of the major river valleys. The uh, second major one is the Egyptian or Nile River Valley in the Northeast African territories. A third major river valley is the Indus River Valley in India. And then a fourth major civilization is going to develop around the Huang He River Valley in China. Now, when did exactly people group a people group become a civilization? Well, that's uh, a question that historians and anthropologists uh, have wrestled with, but they have generally come to some conclusions that a civilization became a civilization when they began to develop several key characteristics. These key characteristics are the development of cities, the development of writing, specialization of labor, the development of complex institutions, and technology. We're going to unpack each one of these here next. The first one is cities. Well, what is a city? A city is a centralized urban setting with a shared culture, economic interests, a political system, a shared religious system, laws. There's generally fortifications and walls for mutual defense. There's generally a network of agricultural and craft production and merchants, all trading and buying and selling for mutual benefit. Uh, there will be some sort of centralized worship, a temple and a cultic system. There's going to be some sort of political leadership or military leadership that develops laws. Uh, this will often be a king in some sort of bureaucracy or uh, state officials. Uh, we're also going to have some sort of urban planning, at least to some degree, where they decide here's where the temple will be and here's where the palace will be. Here's where water systems will be. This is where the domestic spaces will be. And, and developing fortifications, walls, gate systems, um, even developing, in some cases, uh, sewer systems uh, in which you can dispose of uh, waste uh, that, that is detrimental to the city. So all of these things were developed that made cities a city. Here are some examples of some old cities. This is a model of the ancient city of Jericho. Uh, archaeologists have uncovered um, uh, thousands of years of material culture that dates back to about 11,000 years. So this is one of the oldest cities in the world located 
uh, in just in the Judean wilderness in uh, near in Israel on the west side of the Jordan River. Uh, this is a drawing of the ancient city of Babylon, which dates to about 4,000 years ago. You can see in the central part of that image the famed Ishtar Gate. This is uh, the modern state of Iraq is, is where this city is located. And then some of the earliest civilizations were developed in Sumeria, the Sumerian cities of Aridu, Uruk, Ur, Larsa. There's a whole uh, bunch of small Sumerian city-states in the southern part of the Mesopotamian River Valley. Uh, these date to about 7,000 years ago, and they all have a shared culture in southern Mesopotamia. So cities were an important development in civilizations. Uh, another key characteristic is writing. Writing allowed for the recording of laws, business and financial transactions. You could record taxes that were owed to the king or that had been paid. Uh, salaries that were owed or paid, offerings to a god, tribute to a king, uh, inventory lists, receipts, inheritance, poetry, storytelling, even the recording of history. Uh, the great uh, efforts and accomplishments of the king would, would be written down so that uh, future generations would know of the greatness of a king. So all of this was important uh, to write down, and so writing was developed. You hear, you see in this slide an example of something called cuneiform writing. This is a tablet, a Sumerian tablet, and they would take wet clay, and they would form it into a tablet, and they would use uh, these little stylus reeds made out of, uh, or little stylus made out of reeds, and they would use it to form wedges and lines that would create symbols or images that they um, had developed that meant different words. And so this was an early way of writing in the Mesopotamian River Valley area. This next slide here is something you're probably familiar with. This is Egyptian hieroglyphics, and this was another symbol-based uh, writing system. And uh, here you have a, a stella of a gatekeeper at Matai, and uh, he's sitting there at his offering table. You can see the table, which is kind of a weird-looking table. It's got like a little cross. It's got these feathers on top of it, and then the food is kind of floating on top of the table. But uh, this is uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics was a form of writing. Uh, the Phoenicians developed one of the earliest alphabets, uh, or the earliest alphabet, really. Uh, it's very similar to the Hebrew uh, script. This is a proto, early proto-Hebrew script. Uh, the example known here is the Gezer calendar, uh, dating to about the 10th century BC. So these are all examples of writing that was key characteristic of the development of civilization. Another key uh, characteristic is the specialization of labor. As we mentioned earlier, that people began to farm and farm in such a way they were so successful they had a surplus. And if everybody doesn't have to farm for themselves, that means that they can use their time to do something other than farming, maybe something they're better suited for, something that they're more equipped to do or more talented to do. And, and so different specialization of labor types will begin to develop. Of course, you've got your farmers, you still need people to farm. You've got those that are herdsmen, they raise goats and sheep and cattle that help produce cheese and milk and wool and meat uh, for people in the city. Another group that's going to develop are craftsmen. Craftsmen are people that produce goods that can be traded and sold uh, or bartered for. Uh, they were producing pottery, textiles, weapons, farming equipment, jewelry, idols. These are people who uh, that were uh, bakers uh, that took uh, wheat and ground it into flour. They are millers. They are tanners, people who deal with uh, animal skins and, and make it so that you can turn it into uh, leather. They're people who produced carts and produced chariots. They produced clothing. These are craftsmen, and uh, they were a very important part of the specialization of labor. Uh, merchants and traders, of course, took these goods and sold them in markets, either in that city or in caravans to other cities, and they were, again, a very important part of the development of civilization. Uh, of course, you still need a king who's going to run the 
civilization, a city. Uh, but along with king comes a whole royal court system that's going to have civil workers and bureaucrats. These are engineers that design roadways and build walls and fortifications. They, they, they build roads and all the ta they collect taxes, all the things necessary to make a city work and to function on a day-to-day -day basis. And of course, you need soldiers, the, uh, those that are going to guard the king and help fight his wars and protect the people in the city. So all of these functions uh, were possible because of the specialization of labor, which allowed people to do different things rather than just spending all of their time hunting, gathering, and farming. Uh, fewer people were needed to farm so that other people could be freed up to do other tasks. Now, a fourth key characteristic of the development of civilizations were complex institutions, the development of complex institutions. The first one, of course, would be the royalty or the, the development of state and the, the royalty that heads up that state, uh, kings and princes and, and that kind of thing. Of course, the king needs a palace. He needs a throne room, and this is the place that the king conducted his affairs of the state. He met with foreign dignitaries, kingdom officials. He would see citizens who would plead uh, their case before the king and hope that he would render a judgment on their behalf. Uh, all of this was set up and designed so that the throne room would be so impressive, would show all the wealth of the king, the power, the majesty. You can see uh, the king here, an Assyrian king, sitting on his throne with these amazing, what we call cherubim. cherubim. These, are, these are animals, either often the shape of a lion or the body of a lion or a bull, but would have the face of a man. And uh, the idea was to show the power and the dignity and the majesty uh, of the king. And they would be quite intimidating. You would have to walk generally past these uh, on the way into the throne room. You would see them sitting often on either side of the, the throne itself. And uh, all of these were to really impress people who came to see the king. So you've got the development of the institution of royalty and the state. Of course, along with the king, you've got to have a royal court. These are often made up of other important families in the city, uh, other wealthy, powerful families uh, that were often maybe just a tad bit lower than the king. Uh, often these were the people who assassinated the king, quite frankly. Uh, they were often the people who the king had to keep an eye out for, that they may be looking to assassinate him and take over as king. But these were the, the royal court and uh, they provided him with military um, advice foreign there were military advisors foreign advisors uh, they helped the king run the, the business of, of the, the kingdom um, part of that was also just again bureaucrats it takes people to make a city function I mean think about what has to make your city work every day there's garbage collectors there's teachers there's people who uh, work on the water system and the sewer system and there's people who are making roads and building uh, public building spaces. Well, all of those things were part of a city even, you know, four or five thousand years ago. You've got to have people who were collecting the taxes on behalf of the king, people who were designing uh, fortifications, designing roads and building roads, people who were building new palaces and new temples. Uh, all of that was really, really important and they were all part of that royal court system and bureaucracy. Another major institution that uh, came about was the priests who would be the head of the cultic system. Now, when I say cultic, I don't mean in that sort of derogatory sense where I mean like somebody's you know gone crazy and they're part of a cult. No, cult, uh, the cultic system, it's a, it's a technical term, meaning a religious system uh, designed to help the people know how to relate to their deity. And often it was the high priest who spoke to the deities on behalf of the people and spoke to the people on behalf of the deities. Uh, the cultic system were the processes and ceremonies, the sacrifices, festivals, and feasts needed to appease the gods in order to divine their wills. Uh, you had to have the right rituals, the right words, the magic prayers. You had to do it all in the right timing with the right sacrifices in order to appease the gods or to divine their will. So uh, this is all very important, and you had to have somebody who knew how to do that. That's where the priests 
or the high priest came in. They regulated the system, they oversaw it, and uh, they were often some of the most important people, uh, quite frankly, in the kingdom uh, and quite highly uh, esteemed. Uh, along with those cultic systems, of course, you have the temples and the sacrifices. Here you see uh, the temple built by Solomon somewhere around 950 BC in Jerusalem. So uh, a fifth characteristic of the development of civilization is technology, the development of various technologies that help move civilization forward. Uh, here I'm just going to list a couple of examples of what this looked like. Here you have hydraulic engineering. This was the ability to build irrigation and canals and to take water sources and move them to where uh, you needed them to farm. It was about taking marshland and drying it out so that you could produce crops, yet still moving water to places where there were, was no water in order to maximize your opportunities for farming. So hydraulic engineering was quite an important technological advan uh, advance. Uh, you can see here an, another agriculture or farming uh, advancement. This was the Babylonian cedar. This was a machine that would help them plant seeds in a systematic and thorough way. And of course, the plow was revolutionary. Instead of, you know, just digging with your foot or your stick uh, a hole and dropping some seeds in, or just what's called the casting method, just throwing seeds and hope they get buried and hoping something grows. This was the development of the plow where you actually pulled a, a tool that had a stone or eventually metal into it that allowed a furrow or trench to be dug that then you could put the seeds and then cover it back up and then you would have the seeds planted. This was uh, revolutionary, initially just pulled by a person, but then they figured out, oh, we can attach it to an animal <laughs> like a cow or a horse, or in some cases, even a dog. <laughs> and uh, that would help us uh, plow fields uh, much, much quicker. Another technological advance was looming or, or textile looms and weaving uh, fabrics to be able to learn how to take um, uh, cotton or other kind of material and separate it into uh, threads and then take those threads and weave them in such a way that you could produce clothing or other kind of fabrics and textiles was quite an advance as well. Metallurgy. The manipulation of metal ores and the creation of various alloys of metal by mixing different metals with one another in order to create, in some cases, stronger metals, like for weapons, or in some cases, more pliable uh, metals so that you could make you know, jewelry or other kind of art. Uh, this was, uh, again, a significant uh, advance in technology. Uh, we also have the development of the wheel. One of the most important advances is the idea of taking something circular and using it to move things that are heavy or large from one space to another. So they figured out the wheel, then they figured out, oh, if we put this on a cart, then we can haul our goods, our food, our uh, our products to uh, to greater distances for trading. And so the cart was a, a natural uh, evolution of the wheel and then from there they thought oh look if we take that cart and we sort of fortify it and make the platform a little bit bigger and design it such a way we have something called a chariot and you can use it for military purposes and strap a couple of very strong fast horses to it and put an archer in there along with the driver and you've got a uh, what would be the equivalent of an ancient tank uh, for military power so that was all because of the development of the wheel that was all very important. Now we've already mentioned writing as a key characteristic, but that is a technological advance as well, not just uh, writing it by its own, its own category. Uh, the development of advanced mathematics, geometry, astronomy. This was important for engineering, construction, being able to read the stars, to, to develop concepts of time and telling of time. Uh, this would be important for sailing and navigating. These were incredible advances that were all part of the early civilization. And believe it or not, making bricks <laughs> or mass producing bricks. It was a pretty big deal. If you learned how to make bricks and a lot of them, then you could all of a sudden start building what we call monumental architectural architecture, walls and fortifications and gate systems and massive palaces and temples. And so mass produced bricks was a, a pretty cool 
new thing for them. And then along the ideas of mass producing, mass producing pottery. Uh, previously, uh, food was stored and water was stored using animal skins or even animal organs like bladders. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, drinking water out of an animal skin uh, I can tell you I've drank water out of an animal skin. It smells funny <laughs> and it doesn't taste great. They also made baskets to store food, but all of those were, were not like a basket's not watertight. You can't store water in it. Um, they, they tend to mold uh, and deteriorate quite quite quickly. They figured out how to mass produce pottery, which you could use for storing food and water, for cooking, for eating. Uh, this was a, a great advancement for them. So those were the major characteristics for the development of civilization. There were also some secondary characteristics, and I'll just list them briefly. We won't really discuss them, but there's the development of a class structure, you know, the upper class, the lower class, the, the nobles, and, and then the, the, the peasant class. You've got the state organization, which we sort of already touched on, uh, monumental architecture. Again, we've sort of touched on that a little bit, long distance trade. We've barely mentioned that concept of taking goods and trading in distance. And of course, we've mentioned mathematics, arithmetics, and astronomy. These are all secondary characteristics of civilization. Well, who was the first civilization? Well, there are some questions and academic arguments, historical arguments about who was the first, but many will say that the Sumerian civilization was the first. It is the often considered the oldest civilization, located in the southern plains of Mesopotamia between the Tigris and Euphrates River. They, they used irrigation techniques to grow crops sufficient enough to build large urban areas and city-states. And uh, we mentioned earlier they developed cuneiform writing that using wedge-shaped characters pressed into clay tablets. They also developed uh, an educational system, ziggurats, which are temples that are shaped like stair-stepped pyramids. Here on this map you can see where Mesopotamia was. Uh, it's in the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley and uh, the Sumerian city-states are going to be in the southern part of that little area there. You can see on the map, there we go, Sumerian civilizations dating back to like 3500 BC to about 2400 BC. And you can see some of the cities there, Ur, Eridu, Uruk, all of those are considered or were um, Sumerian cities or city-states. There we go, that little area. Now it's going to change. Sometimes it's going to be this, you know, this size and it's going to develop and kind of move and shape. You can see Akkad, one of the cities in the central area just north of Babylon is going to become an important uh, city uh, state in the Sumerian area as well. And uh, here's again a cuneiform tablet that shows you examples of Sumerian text. Here's a Sumerian king's list. This is a clay um, uh, tablet that's four-sided. It's about 20 centimeters by nine centimeters, which is about eight inches by four inches, by the way. But it's a list of Sumerian kings. Here's a Babylonian uh, world map uh, in cuneiform. And then you can see here they engraved uh, the, the name of a king here, Remush, king of Kish, on this murex shell. This dates to about 4000 BC and was found in the Sumerian city of Uruk. Uh, some other things that the Sumerians were responsible for, we sort of already mentioned the wheel, wheeled carts, cuneiform writing, astronomy, lunar calendar, the plow. And uh, here's the development of their writing. It started off with this shape here, the sun, for example. It eventually developed into this shape, and eventually that began to be simplified into that shape, and then eventually this became the late Babylonian cuneiform word, or symbol rather, for the sun. And again, they just used these reed, uh, reed styluses that they made wedges and lines to create words and symbols. You can see a list here of things that the Sumerians accomplished. Again, the number system of tens and sixties and three sixty geometry, medicine, the arch, you know, the Romans made the arch famous, but the um, Sumerians figured it out hundreds of years before the Romans. Cylinder seals, jewelry, sewer systems. Here's an example of a cylinder seal. This is a very small seal. They carved these images directly into the stone, and when you rolled it out into clay, you got the image that was impressed in the clay that was carved into the stone. Here's an example of a uh, seal that's been rolled out into clay and then you would bake it. You can see there's a, I don't know if that's a, a god, and he's got a couple of cows it looks like, or oxen. 
you can see maybe he's watering them it looks like so so that's a cylinder seal so the Sumerian civilization gave way to the very first empire which was the Akkadian Empire the Akkadians were a small city-state that's basically going to take over the Sumerian area and it's going to rise in influence under a guy by the name of Sargon in around 2270 BC and uh, he is going to be, he's it's kind of a cool looking, that's a famous bust there of Akkad, uh, Sargon of Akkad. And it's uh, pretty famous. You can see this is a black and white version of it there. Uh, and notice he's rocking that man bun. And uh, that's, that's you know, made a comeback. Uh, you've probably seen it's very fashionable for people to have the man bun. I'm curious as to who rocked the man bun better. Uh, is it Sargon or is it uh, Jason Momoa? Uh, you can see his side profile here. He looks a little bit like Sargon, I think. So I don't know who did it better, but it's popular again, uh, the, the, the man bun. Uh, here's an example of an Akkadian cuneiform text. Uh, here's an example of uh, Akkadian art. This is um, a very stunning example of um, a human uh, statue. But you can look at how well defined the muscle groupings are on this individual. You can see that bicep there, that shoulder. It's just great detail. This was about 2,000 years before the time of Jesus in the New Testament. Uh, they were already making amazing statues like this. You can see the details in what's left of his beard. You can actually see it looks just like hair. Pretty fascinating. Here is a victory stella of uh, the grandson of Sargon. Uh, his name is Naram Sin, and uh, he was claiming his victory. You can see the details of him claiming victory, stepping on the bodies of his victims. And uh, what's interesting on this stella is he claimed to be the king of the universe. You may have seen in the Titanic, oh, Leo DiCaprio here, he he uh, claimed to be king of the world. But interestingly enough, uh, Naram Sin said he was the beloved of Sin, that was the deity, god of Akkad. He claimed to be a deity himself, and he said he was the king of the universe. That's a pretty big opinion of himself. Here's an example of an Akkadian cylinder seal, and again, what it looks like when it's rolled out into clay. So that's the Akkadians. So first we had the Sumerians, and then we had one of the Sumerian city-states, Akkad, developed the first empire, the Akkadian Empire. And uh, you can kind of see here on the map, that's what it looked like. The Akkadians are going to develop into this large empire, enveloping all of the Mesopotamian River Valley and then moving north and west into the Levant and into uh, what we call Anatolia or Asia Minor. Now, a group, a people group from what we call the Levant area, modern day Syria, called the Amorites, are going to migrate into the Mesopotamian region. And eventually, they're going to become to dominate this area. And this is going to develop into the Babylonian civilization. Uh, this was, like I said, an Amorite people group. Uh, it's going to come in right when the Sumerian uh, Empire, Akkadian Empire, is beginning to collapse. And a guy by the name of Hammurabi is going to be the king. He's best known for his law codes. The Epic of Gilgamesh is written during this period. Uh, this is a, a, a story that tells the adventures of the hero, Gilgamesh. It tells about a global flood, kind of like the story of, of Noah. But uh, this is the Babylonian civilization. They accomplished quite a bit. They um, sort of piggyback on the advances of uh, the Sumerians and uh, they're going to have advancements in complex math, solving the quadratic equation. They're going to build upon Sumerian astronomy. Uh, they're going to build the largest city of the time, uh, Babylon. You can see a picture of what artists believe it looked like, or historians and archaeologists. Uh, they're going to develop a legal code. Again, here's the the uh, Code of, of Hammurabi, which is world famous. Uh, they're going to develop literature, like, the, again, the Epic of Gilgamesh. And... What else? Uh, ziggurats, the big pyramids, stepped pyramids that they're very famous for. The Tower of Babel would be an example of this. And, of course, the Ishtar Gate, which I mentioned earlier, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. There's the Ishtar Gate rebuilt in a museum in Germany, I believe. And, uh, again, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon were quite famous. This is an artist's rendition of what that would have looked like. 
So these are some of the great accomplishments of the Babylonians. And when you look at the map, you can see uh, how the Babylonian Empire sort of looked in comparison to the early Sumerian civilization and the Akkadian Empire that the Babylonian Empire took over. So that's what that looked like. Now, as we move west, we've got the Egyptian civilization in the Nile River Valley. And uh, Egyptian history, as the Mesopotamian image, uh, uh, history, just so much to go through. We're not going to spend any time, but I want you to know there's the upper Egyptian area, which is in the south, and then the lower Egyptian area, which is in the north, because the Nile River flows from south to north into the Mediterranean Sea. And um, you know quite a bit about the um, Egyptian history. You know about pharaohs and the building of pyramids and that kind of thing. So we're not going to spend any time really talking about the Egyptians were an amazing civilization. Um, here's the pyramids. I want you to think about the pyramids were actually built about 2,500 years before the time of Jesus. In other words, more time passed from the time that the pyramids were built to Jesus than time from Jesus to us. So it's only been about 2,000 years from Jesus to our time, but about 2,500 years had passed from the building of the pyramids until the time of the New Testament. So it was quite a bit back in history, but you guys have learned, I know in previous classes, about uh, pyramids and pharaohs in Egyptian history, so we're, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time. But eventually the Egyptian empire will uh, take over not just the, the northeast African area, but also the Levant and up into the Mesopotamian uh, Euphrates area. Another people group called the Hittites is going to come on the scene. This is a group of people that are basically be in what we call the Anatolia or Asia Minor territory. But again, they will expand into the Mesopotamian area, and that's going to put them in conflict with the uh, Babylonians and the Egyptians for resources and land. There we go. The Hittites, by the way, were known, renowned for their use of iron technology. They could produce iron weapons and iron chariots, and they were famed for that. And therefore, they were quite a powerhouse. So you can see those three uh, civilizations and empires and how they kind of overlap and how they were going to be conflicted over resources. Now, in between all of these is this tiny space that we call the land of the Levant, it's Israel, Syria, Phoenicia, the Philistines are there, there's other people groups, but those are kind of the major people groups. Uh, we'll talk about Israel for just a quick second, a rundown of Israel history. If you know the, the Bible, you know it starts off with a guy by the name of Abraham that God is going to call. He's actually from the Sumerian city of Ur, and God's going to call him, eventually send him to Haran and say, I'm going to send you to a land I will show you. Eventually that's Israel. He's eventually going to go to Egypt and then come back, and he'll have his son Isaac. God's going to say, this is your promised son, which I will uh, bring many, many uh, descendants. And then God you know, tests Abraham, says, I want you to sacrifice him. Of course, at the last minute, stops him, provides a sacrifice for him, an alternate sacrifice, a ram. You can see in the picture there that, um, that that's what gets sacrificed in place of Isaac. Uh, Isaac will eventually have his own sons, Esau and Jacob, and from Jacob, one of his sons will be a guy by the name of, you remember this guy? Joseph. And Joseph is going to be sold by his brothers into slavery in Egypt and uh, eventually become really, really important in Egypt. He becomes second in command, uh, second only to Pharaoh. Now, the Hebrews will be there for a good bit of time, and eventually a baby will be born. A guy by the name of Moses will be raised in the Egyptian court and eventually realize that he is not Egyptian, but Hebrew. And uh, if you read in the book of Exodus, you find his story. He ends up having to run for his life into the Sinai Peninsula, where eventually God reveals himself to him. And he becomes, of course, the Moses that we know that is going to go back into Egypt and demand that the Pharaoh let the people go so they can go worship God. And, uh, of course, you all know about the ten signs and wonders and, of course, the crossing of the Red Sea. Well, Moses is going to lead them, lead them into the Sinai Peninsula to, uh, to Mount Sinai where they will get the law of 
of God. Of course, there's a famous scene where Moses is leading the people and they are fighting. And as long as his hands are raised, they're having victory. And you can see a couple of people, Joshua, uh, holding his hands up as long so they can continue to have victory. But they will eventually get the law and uh, the Ten Commandments from God here at Mount Sinai. And uh, Moses will lead the people to build the tabernacle so that they will have a place to worship their God. And uh, eventually, uh, God will lead them uh, after 40 years because they didn't really listen to God, but he will eventually lead them uh, to the point where they can go into the promised land. Moses doesn't actually lead them into the promised land, but a guy by the name of Joshua is going to do that. And Joshua is going to lead them into the land, taking the city of Jericho and eventually conquering the land on behalf of God. Eventually, a couple of kings come along. Saul is the first one, but a guy by the name of David is the first king that really, really develops Israel into a nation state. Uh, It is going to be his son, Solomon, who is going to build the temple to Yahweh. There is a picture of Solomon. And he is going to be the temp- build a temple. Uh, there is an image of the temple. And he will become quite famous for his knowledge and wisdom and his wealth. And here is an image of the Queen of Sheba coming to pay homage to Solomon in his palace. And so that's just a brief history of the nation of Israel. Eventually, Israel will... Um, will divide into a north and a south, north Israel and southern Judah. And eventually the northern kingdom of Israel will be conquered by the Assyrians and eventually the southern kingdom by the Babylonians. That brings us to another territory, a uh, tribal group uh, in Syria. This is the Arameans. And Syria is the capital of which is Damascus, still is today. And uh, here is one of Uh, uh, the statues of one of the kings of Syria. Uh, Syria was kind of located in a crossroads, and they were famed for their caravan trades. Uh, They were the place that people would network, and and you could trade with people in the Mesopotamian river valleys, but you could also trade with people in Egypt and Africa, and then north and west into Anatolia, and even into Europe. And so the Syrians were, were situated in a pretty pretty good little land bridge that connected the major, uh, connected Africa and Europe and Asia at one particular space there. So that's Syria. Another people group we have to note is the Phoenicians. Uh, They were a sea time or maritime uh, kind of people famed for their um, sailing abilities. They they sent um, colonies, uh, colonists all over the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, the famed uh, Carthaginians was a uh, Phoenician colony, and they will dominate the western part of the, the Mediterranean world for centuries. But uh, the Phoenicians were pretty important. They also produced uh, a purple dye by harvesting these seashells. And uh, from this purple dye they could produce and, and this is where purple became associated with royalty because it was so expensive to, you, it would take thousands of these just to produce a few ounces of purple dye. So quite expensive process. So that's the Phoenicians. And then one final people group we're going to talk about is the Philistines and Philistia. They're on the uh, southwest coast there of Israel. The Philistines uh, were also a maritime people, probably coming from uh, Greece, the Mycenaean area, and they settled in various areas areas on the coast of the uh, Levant and in Africa, and uh, the Philistines were probably um, from that people group. So, of course, you know the story of David and Goliath. Goliath was a Philistine. So those are the major or the minor people groups, and uh, I kind of want to put up on the map here these major empires that are going to follow. We're going to see the Assyrians, a major people group from the Mesopotamian region uh, that are going to dominate uh, not just Mesopotamia, but uh, the Levant area, Israel, Syria, and into Africa and Egypt. Uh, This is a picture of Sennacherib, a famous king. And uh, here's a picture of Tiglath-Pileser, another famous Assyrian king. These guys will basically be responsible for bringing, uh, they appear in the Old Testament text, and they are responsible for bringing the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel. 
And then the Assyrians will be conquered by a Neo-Babylonian empire headed by a guy by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. You probably remember him from Bible stories. The book of Daniel talks about Nebuchadnezzar, but he will again basically overtake the Assyrian empire. You can see it there in green. And eventually in 539 BC, uh, the Babylonians will be surpassed by the Persians. And that red is the Persian Empire. You can see images here of uh, Cyrus the Great and Darius, uh, two very important kings of, uh, of the Persian Empire. There you can see one more image of, I believe that is Cyrus the Great. So this brings us to a conclusion of the introduction of earliest civilizations and covers basically earliest history from the Sumerians to the Akkadian Empire to the Babylonian Empire to the Assyrian uh, Empire, the Neo-Babylonian Empire, the Persians, and of course the Egyptians. And we discussed briefly some of the minor uh, people groups, uh, minor states uh, in, in between all of that, Israel, Syria, Phoenicia, and Philistia. That'll do it for us for now. We'll see you on the next video.